Well, good morning. It's good to see all you this morning. And I just confess, as um, like Matt said, you know, spending a lot of time in this text, that um, it's just been extremely, I think, uh, helpful and revealing for me. It's revealed my own hypocrisy and shortcomings um, when it comes to something as vital and as important as prayer. And so I'm hopeful and I'm prayerful that um, this will be an encouraging time for each of us this morning as we are able to be in God's Word together. In J.C. Ryle's little book, A Call to Prayer, he asked a really simple question, and he kind of asked it throughout the book. And his question is this, do you pray? Now, before you check out, I want us to consider this just for a second, because I'm sure many of you are thinking, well, yeah, of course I pray, but we need to look closer at that. And some of you, you may be thinking that you don't really know how to pray, and so you don't do it. And so I'm, I'm hopeful this morning that it's going to be an encouraging time to help us grow in these areas, in this very important spiritual discipline. So I want us to consider for a second what we think of prayer. You know, do we think that this is absolutely necessary for man's salvation? Do you believe that a habit of prayer is one of the surest marks of a Christian? That as John Calvin says, that it is the chief exercise of faith? When you hear quotes that equate prayer for the Christian, like breathing, do you think that, and that sounds a little too extreme. You know, I think many of us, if we're honest, when we examine our prayer life, how often we pray, the things we pray for, I think we all would agree that this is an area that we could be better at, that we could grow in. Friends, our prayer life can be extremely revealing. It could show us where our faith lies, what our hope is in. And I want to be clear that this does not speak to our position in Christ. As we have said over and over, if you have been justified by the blood of Christ and you're a child of God, you are forever secure in this. So your prayer life, however weak it may be, does not speak to your position in Christ. But it possibly does show areas where we, are imma- where we are immature. It might even show a hypocritical spirit at times. And it can even show where our love and affections lie. And what I mean by that is that if we believe that God has given us a way through Christ and the Holy Spirit to commune with God, to pray the desires of our hearts, to ask him to act according to his promises, yet we neglect to do this, then do we actually believe in the power of prayer? I mean, if we examine how much time we actually spend in prayer, what does it say of our love for God? You know, if I only spent a minute or two each day talking to my wife in the morning, and then I went the rest of the day and just didn't speak to her again, what would that say of my love for her, of my desire to be with her? So again, I trust that if we examine our prayer lives, we're going to see that this is an area in which we need to grow. And friends, the reason for this is because we are all sinners, So if prayer truly is the chief exercise of faith, then our flesh and the devil will want nothing more than to find a way to prevent us from doing this. So this morning, we're going to be looking at the Lord's teaching on prayer. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, and this chapter is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. So it's important for us not to just pull this out without an understanding of the sermon as a whole. And so generally speaking, with the Sermon on the Mount, it's got two kind of sections in it. It's got a general section and a practical section. This general section is the first about 16 verses. 
And in there you see Jesus teach on the Beatitudes. He speaks to how Christians respond to the world around them, how the, res- how the world responds to Christians. He talks about being salt and light, that we are to be a light set on a hill. He encourages us that our light should shine before men so that God may receive glory. And so the remainder of the sermon is concerned then with the practical aspects of the Christian life and our conduct. So you see the rest of chapter 5, the Christian's relation to the law. Then in chapter 6, he begins to teach about Christians living, particularly Christians living in the world in the presence of God, entirely dependent on him and in full submission to him. Then in chapter 7, generally speaking, you have an example of how the Christian lives as one who is always under the judgment of God and lives in the right fear of him. So as we said, this this section here in chapter 6 deals with how man lives in the presence of God. Martin Lloyd-Jones said it well. He said, this section presents a picture of the children in relationship to their father as they wind their way on this pilgrimage called life. So Jesus is kind to show us in this chapter that even in the life of one who has trusted Christ, that we are still in need of our Father's care. Sin is ever-present around us. The evil one's greatest desire is to see weary pilgrims fail. But Jesus reminds us here that we have a loving Father who cares for us, and is readily accessible to those who call on him in faith. So in the first 18 verses here of chapter 6, Jesus is going to give three examples of Christian living. And there's a similar theme running throughout. And it's, it's going to be our big idea this morning. And so that is, our Father rewards those who humbly posture their hearts before him. But the world rewards those who pridefully seek the praise of men. So if you would please stand as we read God's word together. And I'm going to begin in verse 1. We're going to read all 18 verses just again to kind of help with the context here. So read with me. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray... Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our father in heaven hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, 
anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. So before we get into our text, that begins in verse 5 here, we need to look at verse 1, because it really sets up this whole section. Jesus tells his disciples to beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So the action here that is taking place is to be seen. So this is repeated throughout these 18 verses. In verse 2, doing things loudly and visible so that you may be praised by others. Verse 5, praying on the street corners that you may be seen by others. Verse 16, disfiguring your faces while fasting to be seen by others. So Jesus is warning them, don't practice these spiritual disciplines, the sacrificial giving, the praying, the fasting, to be seen by men. But this can be kind of confusing, right? Because didn't we just say a minute ago that Jesus says to let your light shine before men? And why do we let our light shine before men? So that God would receive glory. So which is it? Do we let our light shine before men or do we go into a closet and shut the door? Well, as we'll see more clearly in our text this morning, this isn't very confusing. There is a clear difference between those who are seeking the praise of men with their good deeds and those who are seeking to glorify God by their good deeds. This all goes back again to the posture of our hearts before the Lord. So let's take a look then at our text. Jesus is going to give two examples. Okay, He's going to be contrasting a right position of our heart to the wrong way. And then he's going to graciously give us an example, a framework of how this looks. So look at this first example. Verse 5. Jesus says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Now you may be thinking, I don't like to stand on the street corners and pray. Maybe Joe does, but I don't. (laughs) Or maybe you think, I don't really like standing up in front of everybody and praying. I don't like the Sunday night deal where I've got to pray with a bunch of people around. So clearly, then, this isn't talking about me. And that all may be very true. You maybe don't like doing those things. But friend, this warning is still for you. Jesus is still telling us to examine your hearts when you pray. Are you praying for the praise of men? Do you want to look or sound smart? Do you want to, do you want to appear to be spiritual? Friends, you may not be one who enjoys praying in front of others, but when you do, what is the posture of your heart? Listen, I don't know many people who are not influenced by the fear of man. And this influence can lead us to want to appear a certain way, whether that be maybe really humble or mature or wise. Yet Jesus says that if the praise of men is what you want, then that will be your reward. So how do we not pray then like the hypocrites? Well, look at verse 6. Jesus says, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So Jesus says, rather than stand on the street corner so that all can see you praying, go into your room by yourself, close the door. And there you pray to your Father. So this presents a totally different motivation. Rather than seeking the praise of men, now you desire instead to be in the presence of your Father alone. Well, then we have to ask the question, why does Jesus tell us to do it like this? 
I mean, do we really need to go into a closet and shut the door and be by ourselves? I think to answer this, we've got to consider, again, the sermon as a whole. And it is clear that Jesus is teaching here. He is more concerned with the spirit of the law than he is the letter of the law. He values both, clearly. He doesn't do away with the letter, but he is more concerned with the spirit. And you see this clearly throughout chapter 5 as he speaks how the Christian relates to the law of God. I mean, when he speaks of, of lust, he tells us that if a member of our body, like our eye or our hand, is causing us to stumble, then we rip it out or we cut it off. Well, of course, Jesus doesn't want us walking around ripping our eyes out and cutting our hands off. No, he's speaking of the spirit of the law. He's showing the danger of sin and the importance of holiness. The Jewish leaders of the day were too concerned with the letter of the law. This is why they fell victim to the praise of men. They felt they could do enough good, that they could obey all that the law commanded. And this led to pride and seeking the praise of men. So then if Jesus has the spirit of the law in view here, how should we understand what he's saying? Must we really go into the closet to pray? Part of me wants to say, I mean, maybe, that may be necessary sometimes, but not all the time. So first, and I'm going to say this a lot this morning, that Jesus is concerned with the posture of our hearts here. The Pharisees' posture was pride. It was self-promoting. So our desire when we pray is to be in the presence of God, to be alone with him, without distractions. So we need to make sure we understand what we mean when we say alone. Jesus is not teaching that corporate prayer is wrong or that praying in front of your church is wrong. Praying in groups is not wrong. I mean, we can look at his own ministry. We can look at the disciples. They pray with other people often. So whether in a group setting or alone in your house or car, are you humbly coming before the Lord? Is your desire to be in his presence, to glorify him when you pray? Remember, what is the action that Jesus is warning us against? Practicing our righteousness so that we might be seen by others. So are we desiring the praise of men? Like PJ prayed this morning, when we write our prayers, are we concerned about what people are going to think of us when we pray? Do you desire the appearance of holiness rather than the spirit wrought holiness? It's our desire to humbly come into the presence of our Father and to be with him alone. And second, it's, it's not just public or corporate prayers that we need to guard against. It's not the only time we're tempted in this area. Friends, listen, even when we are alone and on our knees in prayer, even there our hearts are tempted. I mean, was this not true of, of Adam and Eve? I mean, they're in the very garden that God created them. In his very presence, yet even there, Satan tempted them into sin. So even when we are praying, even when we are performing this act that many would say is the most noble thing a Christian can do, friends, even there, the enemy is tempting us towards evil. How? I think this, this can look different for many of us, but at times we seek to make our prayers only about us. Or to pray because we think j just this mere action produces some kind of righteousness or, or holiness. So again, let me just be clear. I'm not saying that to pray for yourself or your own needs is wrong. Again, Jesus did this often. No, it, it comes back to the posture of our hearts. We need to ask again, what is the spirit of the law? So Jesus is asking, what's the posture of your hearts when you pray to me? Is there a humility when we come before the Lord? When we pray for ourselves, are we doing it out of a full and utter dependence of the Father's care for us? 
Or is it to remind yourself and God that you're righteous? Maybe that you're better than sinners around you. I mean, is it out of a knowledge of his sovereignty in all aspects of our life? Or, we, or do we assume that we know best and that this is just a mere exercise? We're just going through the motions. Friends, prayer is much more than this. Now, the one who comes before the Lord with a humble heart, not seeking the praise of men, but seeking to be in the presence of their Father, this one, Jesus says, the Father will hear you and reward you. And this idea of reward, again, it's talked about in all three of these examples. And it's always contrasted here. So you have the reward for men contrasted with the reward from God the Father. And yet, these two rewards don't even compare. Now, the praise of men is fleeting. It's temporary. It's really from those who actually see what you've done. Oh, yet the reward from our Father is eternal and is before all men. As one commentator put it, the Pharisees had their reward before all the town, and it was a mere flash and shadow. Yet true Christians shall have theirs before all the world, angels, and men, and it shall be a weight of glory. So then what exactly is this reward? So there's a few things to consider here. that The Christian's ultimate reward is to be with Christ. When Christ returns for his church, we get to see our Lord face to face. We get to be in his holy presence with all the saints for all eternity. That is our ultimate reward. That is what we all are longing for. Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians, he speaks about this reward. He just got done explaining why the ministry of the, of the Spirit and the proclamation of the gospel is greater than that of the law. He says that even that the law is a law of death written on tablets of stone. And he goes on to speak of how we get to participate now in proclaiming this wonderful gospel. And though some are veiled to the truth, that with others the light of the gospel shines into the dark hearts and they believe. So in verse 7, I'm just going to I'm going to read it cuz it's it's, a, it's an encouraging text here. Verse 7 he says, "But when we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us, that we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair." Persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying this body of death, Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be also manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but, light, but alive in you. So now jump down to 16. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So friends, why can... Paul say that we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. It's because of this wonderful reward. It's because the one who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also raise us with him to be in his presence for all eternity. So this is our reward. It is more of Christ getting to be in the presence of God for all of eternity. This is a wonderful thing that we should meditate on day in and day out. Back over here in Matthew, let's look at another aspect of this reward. So Jesus is telling us to pray to the Father in secret, and when we do this, he will what? He will hear us, and he will reward us. 
So friends, part of this reward is that God our Father hears our prayers and he answers them. When we pray according to his will, he hears us and he delights in answering his children. So friends, we've already seen that the posture of our hearts when we come before the Lord must be humble. Even when we pray in groups, when we pray alone in our room, we do not pray seeking the praise of men, but we pray knowing that our Father hears our prayers and he delights to answer them when we pray according to his will in Christ. Now let's move on to verses 7 and 8. Jesus is going to give us another example. He says, And when you pray... Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So here, Jesus shifts to the Gentiles. A few things to note here is that Gentiles did not know God. Their idea of God was that he's like us, and so that he can be influenced then when they pray. They felt they needed to use lots of words or phrases to get God to act on their behalf. That God needs to be informed or solicited. It's also clear that going back to the letter of the law here versus the spirit, that the words we use when we pray are not what motivate God to act. There's not a special formula to use. So again, the the question to ask here is what is the posture of your heart before the Lord? Do you believe that God already knows what you need before you ask him? Or do you think that you need to say it in just the right way to convince him or to maybe change his mind? The problem with this way of thinking is it leads many of us to just not pray at all because we're worried about what to say or that we're going to say something wrong. So, Before we get into this example that Christ gives us, let's just look back over these two examples. Jesus is showing us that when we pray, we must examine our hearts as we come into the presence of God. And like we already said, most people, most people here, they don't like to stand up and pray in front of people. So then how do we apply these warnings? We said Jesus is concerned here with the posture of our hearts. He is concerned with why we are praying when we come before the Lord. Are we seeking the approval and the praise of men? Or are we coming before him as humble children? Are we praying in faith, knowing that God knows what we need before we ask him? Do we think we have to use certain words to manipulate or inform his decision? Now, Jesus is showing us here that there's not a special way to do this. There's not a special place, but it's about your heart. Prayer is not something we do nonchalantly. A lot of people will say things like, prayer is just a conversation with you and God. And though I think that there's truth in that. Let's not think that this is just like a conversation between you and one of your buddies. There is a reverence and a respect that we should have. There's a fear that we should have when we come into the presence of God. This this is not like coming, you know, a kid coming before his dad and asking for a gift and he gives it to him. The next day he does the same thing and the dad slaps him. No, we we know what God is like. We don't we don't come into his presence wondering if he's happy today or if he's sad today. If he's gonna be angry with us or if he's maybe gonna be willing to give us a good gift. No, friends, this fear is one of adoration, and it's one of awe. It's one of knowledge and faith. When you realize that you are in the presence of the one who should be your executioner, yet because of the work of Christ on the cross, because you are clothed in his righteousness, you are able to call him Father. Friends, Jesus is instructing us here to come before your Father humbly and reverently, knowing our Father knows what we need before we even ask Him. So this should give us a sense of peace and relief that we don't have to use special words. We don't have to be in a special place. 
but we can come before him humbly like a child comes before their loving father and lay our request before him. But now Jesus is going to give us a, a framework, an example here of how to pray. So let's look at this together. This is what many again call the Lord's Prayer, starting in verse 9. He says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So Jesus gives us just a wonderful framework here to shape and mold our prayers. These are things that really should lead and guide our prayers. He's going to give us six petitions. And these petitions, they're not meant to box us in, but rather to guide us. Okay, to restrain us and to to allow us to know the things in which we should pray for. And maybe even an order of how we should pray for them. And we can divide these petitions up into two groups. Okay, you have the first three being about God and his glory. Then the last three being about man and our need for God. And this prayer emphasizes what we've already talked about this morning. That prayer is concerned with the posture of our hearts. This prayer is not to men. It's to our Father. Our chief concern is not our will, but God's will. And it's done in faith, knowing that the Father loves to commune with his children. So if we only pray about ourselves and our needs, yet neglect to acknowledge the glory of God and his kingdom, then like John Calvin says, this would be altogether preposterous. So right off the bat, Jesus tells us here to pray our Father. I mean, just the mere fact that he tells us to do this is is incredibly humbling. I mean, we are able to call God our Father. And are we able to do this because we've made ourselves worthy to do that? Have we somehow brought about this righteousness? Have we adopted ourselves into this family somehow? Of course not. We call God our Father based solely on the imputed righteousness of Christ that we receive through faith in his work on the cross. So beginning our prayers this way with our Father, it means this teaching is for Christians. A pagan does not know God as Father. And there's a sense where, yes, God is the Father of all he has created. Friends, but if you are not a Christian, if you are not in Christ, then you do not know the loving, relational Father. So listen, if you're here this morning and you have not trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then friend, the most loving thing I can say to you right now is that you are not a child of God, that you are his enemy. Ah, But the good news of the gospel is that it is offered freely to the enemies of God. This last Wednesday at, at Verse by Verse, we were looking at a text in 1 Corinthians where Paul is speaking to the unrighteous and or speaking about them and how that they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> because the inheritance is what? It's for the children of God. But he lists off this long list of sins and sinful lifestyles, sexual sin, homosexuality, drunkenness, greed. There's a long list there. And listen, this is, it's really important for us to see because, again, if you're here this morning and you're, you're not a Christian, you may be thinking something like, oh, yeah, but you don't know my past. You don't know the things I've done. And that's true, I don't. But God does. And the gospel and his grace is greater and more powerful than your sin. So after Paul goes through this long list he just says something really powerful in verse 11. And this is, we spent a lot of time on this on Wednesday night. But he says, and such were some of you. 
But he says, you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So friends, this is the wonderful truth of the gospel. That we have been washed. We have been sanctified and justified by our Lord Jesus Christ. So friend, if you have never believed this, then friend, don't think you need to go and clean yourself up first. That is what the blood of Christ does. It washes you and it cleanses you. So friend, trust in Christ today. Grab one of us to talk to. Somebody is up on stage here. Just grab somebody and talk to them about this. Don't wait. So friends, we should come to God as our Father. And we do this while acknowledging his power and authority. Why? Because it says, our Father in heaven. So if by calling him Father, we gain confidence to approach him boldly, declaring that he is in heaven gives us confidence that he has all power. He has all dominion at his fingertips. Now we see then in our first of the six petitions in verse 9, that hallowed be your name. So our, our supreme desire then is that the name of God would be honored and glorified. That his name should be sanctified. It should be set apart from all other names. And so how do we do this in our prayers? Well, Psalm 9 verse 10 says, And those who know your name... Oh, they put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. So those who trust in the Lord, they know his name. Well, how do we know his name? His word. His word informs us of this. This is where he declares his name to us. That he is the great I am. Meaning that he is the God who is. He has always been and always will be. He has no beginning and no end. Nothing and no one else in all creation can claim this. It tells us that he is the Lord who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That he is God Almighty, who is infinite in power. Nothing can thwart his divine will. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Isaiah says that he is the high and lofty one whose name is holy. Friends, he is holy and altogether separate from us. And this is all found in his word. So this should be the greatest desire of our prayers, to see God's name hallowed, to see it honored and glorified. But to know how to do this, friends, we must know his word, what he says about himself. We hallow his name. We honor his name when we pray truth from his word back to him. And this this continues as we see the second petition that your kingdom come. So when we pray for God's kingdom to come, what are we wanting to see happen? Well, first, we're praying for the return of Christ. For that's when his kingdom comes in full. When Christ will establish his perfect rule in creation. He will create a new heavens and a new earth. He will make all things new. He will cleanse that which is unclean and he will fix that which is broken. But in another sense, we're also praying that the kingdom would come now in the lives of those who don't know him. So this goes back to what we just talked about. If we desire for God's name to be honored, his name to be hallowed among men, our friends, and this should encourage us to pray for missions, that we would desire for people to honor and glorify God, that they would Praise his name. Friends, the purpose of missions is not for the nations. 
but rather that God's name would be honored and glorified among the nations. These things are not separated. God's name being honored and glorified and the kingdom coming, they go together. I mean, all these petitions go together. And they can all stem from the fact that we want God's name to be glorified. We see this again even in the next petition that we want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, this this is going to flow. God's name being honored to his kingdom coming to now there being obedient Christians on earth. Just like the heavenly beings obeying all that God has commanded. So we are praying that God's will, the things he desires, like his kingdom coming and his name being honored, oh, that these things would come before our will. That we would be willing to bow to the sovereign will of our Father. That we would be willing to make sacrifices to be obedient to his will. And we should pray that this would be the heart of our church and God's people. Oh, would God remove any stubbornness in our hearts that would lead us to rebel against the things that are according to his will? Now this leads us into the next three petitions, which are concerned with man. So again, the first three highlighted the goodness of God, the power of God, the sovereignty of God, and the fact that God is worthy to be praised by his creation. But now in these next three, we see man's utter dependence on God. We see that our only response when we come before him is that of humility and reverent fear. We are in need of his daily provision. We're in need of his forgiveness. And we're in need of his deliverance and guidance. So let's look at each of these briefly. So the fourth petition He says, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus begins these petitions by praying for our physical needs. For us to be able to receive forgiveness and deliverance and guidance, we we need to be alive to do this. So it's good to pray for our physical needs. But you notice that he doesn't say pray for an abundance. Jesus says pray for your daily bread. He doesn't say weekly or monthly. Now he says, pray for what you need now. But you also see a humility in this prayer. Because it comes right off the heels of, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we've just, in our prayers, we've just spent time praying to the all-powerful, all-knowing God and creator of the universe who is reigning from his heavenly throne. And now we as weak and needy children come to him and ask for our daily provision. As I, as I study this, I kept reading through this, I, the image I had in my head is like walking into the Oval Office and asking for your food stamps. Yet that's what's happening here. Jesus is telling us to do just that. But the difference is that God delights in giving his children good gifts. This is not meager to him. This is not a welfare program to God. Scripture tells us that our Father delights in providing for his children. And it tells us that when we pray for our necessities, our Father delights to give in abundance. Jesus is instructing us here to come before your Father in faith, being dependent on him to sustain you. And this leads into this fifth petition, that forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And some people, I think, raise a question here and say, well, why do Christians have to ask for forgiveness? You know, if we've already been justified in Christ. And I don't know if Jesus is really talking about forgiveness here in a salvific sense. If you've been justified by the blood of Christ, then it is just as if you had never sinned. And you had already obeyed the law of God perfectly. Because you've been clothed with the righteousness of the one who did just that. So it's interesting here that 
Matthew uses the word debts. So we usually think of sin here, and I think that's, that's right, but why do you think Matthew uses debt? You know, when we're in debt, we're carrying around a burden. I mean, think about a financial debt, whether it's maybe a school debt or a, a big car payment. It can be a huge burden on us. It can be restrictive for us. And how freeing it is when that debt is removed, when that burden is removed. Friends, our sin creates this kind of burden on us. Yet Jesus says that he takes our burdens upon him. And he gives us his burden, which is easy and it is light. So friends, we are to confess, we are to hand our debts over to God. To relieve these burdens from us. But then the second part of this speaks of our willingness to, to do this to others. To forgive others their debts. Because the one who has been forgiven by God, who understands unbelievable grace and mercy in the atonement, must be willing to forgive when hurt and sinned against. I mean, this should remind us of the parable in Matthew 18 of the unforgiving servant. The servant who owed his master more than he could ever pay, and the master forgave him. Yet what do we see the servant do right after that? He goes out and finds somebody that owes him a fraction of that. And he beats him and he throws him into prison. And Jesus makes the point that if we are not willing to forgive these debts, one, then your father will not forgive yours. I think the reason is because you don't understand what the father has done for you. You don't understand this forgiveness. If you're unwilling to forgive, Jesus is asking, do you, do you get it? Do you understand? Do you know what you have been forgiven? I mean, this is so important that Christ even gives kind of a, a sidebar after this prayer. In verses 14 and 15, Jesus says, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, then neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So we've already said this is addressed to Christians. So this is not talking about our salvation. It's instead, it's it's a test of sorts. A man who has experienced the forgiveness of God is a man who joyfully forgives others. I'm not saying that it's easy to do that. But friends, if you understand what Christ has done for you, the debt that has been removed, how can we not do that for others? So friends, we must examine our hearts here. Are there people that you are unwilling to forgive, to remove a burden of debt from? Is there someone who has hurt you so deeply that you don't see how you could ever forgive them? Friends, we need to look no further than the cross that our Savior died on to see the other darkness and depravity of our sin. That it took the death of the very Son of God to atone for it. We are in debt so deep before God that there was no way possible for us to pay it. Yet our debt has been forgiven and at great cost to him. Friends, but it was so that we might have our burden removed and be free in Christ. So if we are unwilling to forgive others, then we have to ask, do we have the right view of our sin and of God? Do we think that the sin others commit against us is greater or worse than our sin against God? I mean, think about the vision that we saw earlier that Isaiah had. Just at the mere sight of the presence of God, he falls down as one dead and says, woe is me. That is what the holiness of God does to sinners. And this is the one that we sin against. The one whose glory fills the whole earth and who his angelic beings sing holy, holy, holy about. This holy God has offered us unclean and unholy sinners forgiveness 
through the blood of his son. So if we believe this to be true, friends, then we must forgive others. Well, so now we need to look at our last petition. So we have prayed for our physical needs. We've confessed and prayed for forgiveness. And now we see Jesus instruct us to pray for guidance and deliverance. Jesus says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we have just prayed for the forgiveness of our sin. But now we must pray that we would not again return to that sin. And again, this is just, this is a humble heart. To ask God not to lead us into temptation, we're acknowledging our complete and utter dependence upon him. We also realize that temptation and trials are going to come. That the Lord knows in his good providence which of these trials we can, we can undertake, we can handle, which is why Jesus instructs us to pray. To pray for guidance. To pray for deliverance. He tells his disciples in the garden when he found them sleeping after he had asked them to pray for him, watch and pray that you may not fall into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So this is a prayer for holiness. And Jesus tells his disciples, listen, the spirit is willing, desires to lead us in holiness. Oh, but your flesh is weak. We need guidance. We need to be delivered from evil. So I think this prayer can look like many things for us. You know, many of us know the areas in which we are tempted, but oftentimes we don't. And so we need to ask God to make us aware of these blind spots, to give us wisdom and guidance. I wish I had time to read all of the Westminster Confession here, or the Catechism, I mean. Question 195 deals with, with this petition. And so I just want to kind of summarize what this answer says. Because it talks about really all aspects of our temptation. And it says, we pray that God would lead us away from temptation. But when we are tempted, that he would strengthen us to resist it. And if and when fallen into sin... He would, by his grace, restore us. That he would deliver us from that sin. And that he would one day, the day that we are all longing for, do away with sin, the devil, and the flesh once and for all. So friends, when we look at the Lord's Prayer, do we see that this encompasses really all aspects of the Christian life? that are hallowing and honoring God's name, that our desire to see his kingdom come, for more people to come to a saving knowledge of God, for the obedience of the saints in doing the will of God, for our own daily needs and our confession of sin, for our desire to live holy lives in the power of the Spirit. Friends, this is what this prayer is. This is, this is the framework that it gives us when we pray. Now, some of you might be thinking that you thought maybe there's a little more to the Lord's Prayer than this. And we talked about this the other night, that some of the older manuscripts, after Deliver Us From Evil, it says that for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I just want to hit on this briefly. We don't have time to get in this too much. But, you know, the newer manuscripts don't include this, obviously. I just want to mention here, that whether the manuscripts say it or not, that this idea is it's, it's still very biblical to pray this way. It's really it's a doxology of sorts. Because after finishing our petitions to the Lord, oh, that we should acknowledge that He is all powerful and that all authority belongs to Him, that He is to be glorified above all for all times. So, friends, Praying that is right and good. So now in closing, I just, I want us again to consider this framework. What are we, what are we supposed to do with it? And first I just want to say, if, if you're still sitting there and, 
You think, I, I still just don't know how to pray. Let me encourage you to do what Jesus tells us to do right here. Go home, sit in your room, shut the door, and pray this prayer. Pray the Lord's Prayer, and as you do, examine your heart. Does your, does your heart align with the humility of this prayer? Or does your heart delight in honoring God's name and submitting to his will? Are you examining the spirit of the law here? Because again, there's not an exact way that, that we can give you of you have to pray this way. But friends, we need to examine our hearts. Oh, if there's pride, ask for humility. If there's fear of man, ask for the fear of the Lord. If there's an unwillingness to forgive, oh, ask for greater understanding of the holiness of God. And friends, finally, I ask that, you know, at the, at the beginning of this, the question was, do you pray? I just want to impress again here that really no, no Christian can answer no to that question. I mean, Jesus says three times here, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray. He's not saying that, hey, listen, when you have time, you may consider doing this or... You know, if, if things are really stressful and difficult in your life, now that's a good time to do this. Now he says, when you pray. I mean, Paul says that we are to pray without ceasing. So friends, prayer for Christians is like breathing. We cannot live and function without prayer. Friends, if you need greater encouragement here, come and talk to me. I'd love to pray with you. Several of our members, we want to pray with you. We want to encourage this. We want to be a prayerful people, a people who are dependent upon the Lord, upon our Father. Pray with me.